guys, welcome back to either the Arsenio Buck Show or Arsenio's ESL Podcast. I'm putting this onto both because I believe both audiences need this. For those of you on my ESL Podcast, you already know her. You already miss her. You've been asking for her for such a long time. Katrina and I have <laughs> rocked the house on so many occasions to give you guys tips and whatnot for English language training. But this is more of a mindfulness practice type of podcast. And this is why I'm going to be doing this simultaneously on both podcasts, because I believe both audiences need this most right now. So for those of you who do not know Katrina on the Personal Development Podcast, born and raised out there, well, I'm not exactly sure, but let's just say Omaha, Nebraska, she will correct me within the next five seconds if that is incorrect. And then she ended up teaching out there in Greece and Panama, and now she's back there. And now she's focusing more in things that are in alignment with her. You know, having that set up in the background and having my boy Curious George, me and him go way back. Me and him go way back. I've gotten Curious George haircuts before, people. That was back in 2005. But the lack of hair that I have now, that is, uh, that's impossible to do now. But nonetheless, for everyone out there, guys, this is going to be a powerful podcast in terms of uh, stress relief tips, mindfulness, Getting a perspective shift in what's happening around us. There are so many people that are falling into the abyss that people are posting out there. But how can we control what is around us? There's going to be a range of different topics that we're going to be focusing on. And without further ado, Katrina, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me again. And you, yes, you can introduce me as being from um, Omaha, Nebraska, but you were right in, in like questioning that because I grew up in an Air Force family and moved around a lot. And, but yes, Omaha is what I call home. But I love that, like you, you know, we have both been teachers who have traveled around a lot. And so we get all of our influences from so many different places. Absolutely. And, you know, just a boy in the stories and, you know, you having taught online and now you focusing on mindfulness. Um, and in regards to mindfulness, I don't remember the last time I brought someone on my personal development podcast to talk about mindfulness. Now, folks in my ESL podcast, probably sometime last year, about six months ago, they are probably a little bit aware. But now that audience has grown significant, you know, from Peru to Afghanistan to just different, you name it, you know. So for those people, on both podcasts, either or, who do not know what mindfulness is, do you mind feeding us a little bit right now? Yes. Okay. So mindfulness is paying attention on purpose to the present moment without judgment. And how I found mindfulness was I was an elementary school teacher at, um, in Nebraska, United States, and we had a behavior consultant visit our school to help elementary school teachers kind of problem solve with different um, behavior cases and just help with classroom management. And she taught all of the teachers this really simple mindfulness strategy. And I used that in my classroom. And I found that after this quick couple minute technique, I felt calmer and like I was a better teacher. And then my students afterwards were, um, it gave them perspective. So the things that they were complaining about before, it just kind of subdued all the little kind of whiny, trivial things. Right. And people collaborated more, more and their productivity increased and so naturally, when I moved overseas then to teach English at an American international school in Greece, I took that same mindfulness strategy with me to Greece. And I was teaching all grade levels there. And the same thing happened where it didn't matter the age level, right? Everybody was benefiting from this mindfulness technique and teachers were asking me, how did you get so-and-so to write for so long? How did you get them to interact with their peers without fighting? So yeah, then I took that with me to Panama. Then I took that with me when I came back to the U S and I was teaching adults, English language learners. 
And it was because there was that very drastic, striking similarity that mindfulness serves everyone, no matter their age, no matter their language, their socioeconomic status. Everybody was asking for more. And so I left traditional education and I am now a contract mindfulness teacher. So I teach to children and I teach to adults. And I love that now with all of this coronavirus impact in the world, people are seeking more mindfulness and knowing that I have got to reduce my stress level because when people are experiencing greater levels of stress, that lowers the immune system, right? We want to keep ourselves healthy. (laughs) Stress reduction and mindfulness has as a side effect, calm, lower cortisol, the stress hormone, all of these amazing side effects of practicing mindfulness. So I'm glad that people are seeking out very healthy ways of cope when dealing with all of these strong emotions related to this pandemic. Couldn't have come at a better time, to be honest with you. And, you know, a lot of people, we do have a tendency, I mean, you, there are just a lot of different scenarios. It goes from panic buying, uh, and that's what a lot of people are doing right now around the world. And, you know, places being on lockdown, economies are falling apart. And, you know, this all has to deal with something, like I told you before the podcast, that has existed for more than 10,000 years, apparently, since 8,000 BC. And so now, you know, people are being controlled by what's happening. The circumstances around them, rather than having that self-control and literally focusing on themselves. So when it talks, like people are stressed out. I'm going to be honest with you. Like jobs have fallen apart. Airlines have furloughed the majority of their staff. Language centers, like I just talked about uh, just recently with a couple of people, have uh, and on my Instagram TV that, you know, they're going out of business now. There's no coping mechanisms. There are no backup plans. There are staff members who are like, well, I got to pay rent. How am I supposed to pay rent? You know, these things are happening all around the world. And so, again, we could talk about, you know, a different perspective, like, okay, how can they keep themselves busy? But that's not what we're going to be focusing on in this podcast. We're going to be focusing on that stress relief. And Mm -hmm. so when it comes down to stress, what are, you know, obviously the factors that contribute to our stress has to be a lot of factors that, you know, are way outside of our control. Like, again, losing your job. I mean, there's nothing you can do to keep that job. But what could you do now? But again, so when it comes to stress, you know, the last time we spoke and we spoke for like an hour and a half off, you know, off video and whatnot or off, you know, off the podcast. You know, there was a lot of stress in the world. So I want you to, again, we just talked about that situation with the whole news thing. I think that's extremely important because, again, we're all connected. We were talking about Backstreet Boys' Shape of Heart, one of my favorite songs. I don't care. I'm saying that. I don't care. Now, I'm saying that out there, and I'm putting that out there, okay? Because, you know, when I was a kid, I couldn't tell everybody, but I'm telling everybody now so y'all can kiss my butt. But now... After that happened, you went for a walk, it was raining. You went back, you grabbed your umbrella, you went out. Things changed. I want yeah. you, and again, this was definitely stress management because you were telling me at that time, you were like, I just want to go back to sleep for 13 hours. I said, but the Wi-Fi and the Wi-Fi problems you're having, <laughs> you're having right now, they're going to come back. They're going to come back, Katrina. You're going to get even more angry. I was like the ultimate instigator. instigator. I'm sorry about that. And, uh, but what happened? I want you to give us a story how you ended up managing your stress that day and it ended up turning into a beautiful opportunity. Yes. So I was talking to you early and it was early in the morning, my time. Yep. Um, and you made me aware of the fact that I kept cutting out my internet connection and I was getting very frustrated because I now more than ever, I need internet for teaching my mindfulness classes online, for 
connecting with others as we're all practicing this self um, distancing, this isolation, etc. And I had been frustrated because someone the night before had also commented on me cutting out. And it was while I was teaching a class, you know, with you and our informal conversation, not as big of a deal. But so I was getting very frustrated and I already had been feeling a lot of other heavy emotions because I had felt myself kind of absorbing the woes of others. Um, so when I got off the call with you, I decided to, decided to honor my self care and I left the house to go take a walk. And yes, it was raining. I did come back and I got my umbrella and I decided I need to walk anyway, because in those times of stress, the old me and lots of people decide, oh, well, to make the stress go away, I need to get my to-do list items done. Boom, 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 boom. And that'll make me feel better. But it's exactly in those times when we're feeling whelmed and we have all of these things to do, when we need to take a break so that we can lower the stress level right. so, so that then we can be present with our task at hand and be more efficient and choose more skillful, wise responses. Right. So yes, I left and I took a walk in the rain with my umbrella and I made it to the park. And once I got to the park, I was, I became aware of sounds of birds and that just brought me a lot of joy. And so I decided to do a spontaneous, informal mindfulness practice where I just sat down on some wet landscaping rocks and I just closed my eyes and I used the sounds as my anchor. So in mindfulness, we call anchor the thing that we focus our attention to. Okay. Um, and so I was just listening and listening to the sounds of the bird, the sounds of the birds. And um, it was just bringing me much relief because it was something peaceful and soothing and therefore I was in the present moment I wasn't freaking out about what's going to happen if I can't get my wi-fi back working you know I wasn't ruminating about stuff in the past I was solely focused on the sounds of the birds when I did open my eyes I saw standing about 12 feet away from me there was a man holding a giant camera and, um, he smiled, was very friendly, asked me if he, he said he had taken some pictures of me and asked if he could put them in the newspaper because he's a photographer from the newspaper. Yeah. And I was, I, I had some questions for him right away because I was just kind of taken aback. First of all, um, typically my choice of being photographed would not be when I'm in my wet pajamas, having left the house immediately, you know? <laughs> um, but I told him that I was doing a mindfulness practice and um, he had all these questions about mindfulness and was basically saying that this is exactly what people need during this time of uncertainty and fear and panic is people need something healthy to use as a way to cope and look inward. Um, he ended up asking me if he could pass on my information to a reporter at the newspaper. And I said, sure, like if you can use me as a way to spread this message of how mindfulness is free and accessible to us all to promote all this kind of mental health, self-care, et cetera, by all means. Um, the next day, the reporter called me. The following day, there's a mindfulness story that was published in the local newspaper. And I got all kinds of wonderful responses from people about, um, because the, though the reporter and I had spoke a long time about mindfulness, it was interesting to me 
that the parts that she pulled out of what I just say, the majority of the parts that she posted in the article were about mindfulness, self-compassion. And um, the response was beautiful about people saying, this is what I need to hear right now. This is what I need to hear right now, that my emotions are all valid. So mindfulness, self-compassion has, has a few different steps. But the first step is just bringing attention to what is it that I'm feeling. And so it could be multiple emotions, right? Like that day that I was talking to you that I needed to go for that walk immediately, it was a lot of emotions. So during this pandemic time, for a lot of people, it's fear or uncertainty, overwhelm, um, disappointment because of the events and the things that they normally look forward to are all canceled. There could be loneliness because we're cut off from our social networks. Um, there could be extreme anxiety, confusion, boredom. And so the, so um, a counselor who I know of, she, she uses the phrase, if you can name it, you can tame it. So if you can name the emotions that you're feeling, it makes those emotions less scary. Yes. Right? Because it's, it's the fear of the unknown that a lot of us have. But if we can give ourselves the self-compassion to just acknowledge, okay, this is a moment of suffering in the form of fear, confusion, um, anxiety, anger, etc. And then the next part of self-compassion is remembering the common humanity of these emotions are not unique to me, right? I am human like everyone else. And like all humans, part of the human experience is experiencing all emotions of the spectrum, and so once we realize that we're all in this together, then it, um, it brings a sort of sense of relief of not feeling lonely and feeling connected. And that connection just brings so much relief. So in those stages of self-compassion, we said, we just went over that the first part is just acknowledging what emotions we're feeling, right? Yep. Um, and acknowledging that it is a moment of suffering in whatever form. Yeah. Then remembering that this is, um, that suffering is part of the human experience. Mm -hmm. And then the third part of mindfulness, self-compassion is giving ourselves the same concern, comfort, and care that we would give a good friend who was suffering. Mm -hmm. And then just setting an intention of, may I be kind to myself in this moment? Mm -hmm. or replace it with whatever words for, feel natural for you, right. right? May I give myself the compassion that I need? So a lot of us, you know, we have this, we automatically go to the negative self-talk. Yep. And so in the times of feeling strong emotions, they're already difficult but what we then do is we actually feel guilty for feeling these emotions. And that only makes it worse. So mindfulness is about being in the present moment. So if we can be in the present moment and actually just pause to feel what we're feeling and then give ourselves compassion for feeling like that, it will bring so much relief. Man, that is so beautiful. You know, in terms of listing those steps, I was just telling you about the things that I was experiencing, you know, a couple of days ago. And again, me, I hurry up and identified it like, okay, Arsenio, you keep looking out the window. Why is it that you keep looking out the window? And I remember going back about eight years, I would always look out the window when I was a dental assistant. And it was always because I'm like, well, I feel like I want to be outside. I want to be outside in 
that sunshine. I want to be outside communicating with people because I crave that face-to-face -face interaction. So that's me becoming aware of my feelings. And that's one tip, you know, for mm -hmm. stress management. It's like, okay, Arsenio, well, for people around the world who are experiencing, you know, setbacks in terms of their job, in terms of their finances, okay, what feeling am I feeling right now? What is this? Okay, I got the source. Okay, so the source is this. So let's see what exactly happened. Okay, but now what can I do about that? You mm -hmm. know, because a lot of people, again, with the stress and naming it, especially, I heard that on an Eric Thomas podcast. Um, and he was, again, myself, a long time ago, I had something called rage. And this rage, it could have been because of what I saw between my father and my mother when I was a child, when they would just go crazy on each other back in the 1995 to 1997 or 1998. Or this could have developed over a series of events, which I think was the probable cause during this particular situation in 2003. But then what I did, I was like, okay, Arsenio, something's not right. And then just like you, the reporter coming up to you, a guy by the name of Manny in my fourth period class came up to me and said, Arsenio, do you still want to do track and field? And I said, absolutely. And that rage, what I named it as, I took all of that out on the track. And again, mm -hmm. there were times that I suffered big setbacks and I cried and I kicked and I screamed when I lost the race. And that was my very first race. But then when I won, all of that rage ceased to exist. It was no more. So these are really, really, that, that was a very critical, why is it do you think that we should name it? Can we dive deeper into that? Like, because you're the second person that have said this, mm -hmm. you know, that has said this. So what, why is it, do you think it's very important to, to name it? So first of all, I, the, those steps of self-compassion that I shared, I did not reference um, Kristen Neff, but her book, Self-Compassion, Okay. Kristen Neff is th this mindfulness, self-compassion guru. I highly recommend any of her content. This book is great. Her TED talk. Um, so something that I, I see over and over and over in the mindfulness world and, and really in any of the personal develop, uh, personal development material that I consume is that when we don't know what something is, right that makes it scary and something that we try and push away. Ah. The second though, that we do name it and look at it for what it is, then it makes it less scary because we realize, okay, that's anger, right? And part of, part of mindfulness too is not attaching to it, not identifying with I'm an angry person, but rather Okay, what it, the emotion coming up is anger, or observing, this is anger, this is what it feels like. Maybe even noticing as part of mindfulness what it feels like in the body. So, you know, anger could be an increase in heart rate. It could be my face is getting warm or tightness in the chest or not in my stomach or my fists are feeling clenched or my sh shoulders are getting hunched. But as soon as we take the time to become aware of it and what our habit is, yeah. then we can do something to change it. So in mindfulness, what happens is we are learning to be with whatever the emotion or physical sensation or thought is. We're learning to be with it just as it is. And so mindfulness is not always this magical image of what you might see in a magazine of somebody sitting still in this beautiful garden with a waterfall and magical butterflies floating around them. My calm and peace absolutely can be a side effect of mindfulness. But some of the times when mindfulness has served me most has been the times when I have been experiencing the most unpleasant emotions. Somebody says something, yeah. it automatically yeah. triggers a negative response. 
I take a moment just to pause and note to myself, what is that emotion that I'm feeling and what are the physical sensations in the body? And then by practicing mindfulness, it allows me to take the time to look inward. And because I'm taking the time to pause and look at myself, I'm able to make a more wise choice and I'm less likely to regret my reaction. Um, whereas, you know, you mentioned things like rage. Um, for some people in terms of rage or other unpleasant emotions, the first thing that we do when something bothers us is we, we lash out, we react in a way, whether it's yelling, you know, something violent or saying something we regret and you're like, Oh, I wish I just would have, you know, taken the time and thought about my actions first. Well, we're in a habit loop, this autopilot response of how we've reacted for years and years and years. We can break that habit loop. Mindfulness just sitting and being still and just observing what's coming up for us allows us greater awareness of what's happening inside of us so that we can make more skillful choices. Wow. You know, when it comes to, what about, okay, so again, like it's, it's always the reactionary response that we have with, um, you know, with mindfulness, but what about empathy for other individuals? Is there, is there like, because like for people who deal with individuals who seemingly always mistreat them for whatever reason, again, it's all based on us, but is there a way that we could like have that empathy for other individuals also? Because you, of course you said self-compassion, but like, what about for the other person or situations? Yes, yes. And um, I'm glad that you brought this up. So there is a part of mindfulness that's called heartfulness that entails all of these things like loving kindness and compassion and empathy and forgiveness and gratitude. And there are many attitudes of mindfulness. They include everything from non-judgment, non-striving, patience, trust, acceptance, letting go, gratitude, humor, curiosity. And so the, keep going. Sorry. Yes. Yes. I mean, gosh, let's let's bring him. And for those for those personal development folks who are listening to this, uh Curious George is always uh he's always in the background saying what's up to me, giving me high fives and whatnot, but he's always engaged with our in uh, conversations, you know, especially in the ESL. So Curious George, curious adjective for ESL folks. Curiosity is the noun, and that's what we're focusing on. That's exactly what you just said. So what is that about? Yes, yes. So Curious George here is a symbol for curiosity, which is something that we wish to encompass during mindfulness. It's a very important component, component of mindfulness because curiosity can help us from stopping the judgment that happens, mm. right? In mindfulness, we want to be aware. So we can be aware of, oh, I'm experiencing judgment. And just don't make it worse by keep judging the judging. Something that can help the judgment subside is curiosity. Of So if we're about to judge ourselves, be curious about, oh, why am I feeling like that? Mm. So when you brought up other people and having empathy, something that can help us to have compassion for other people is instead of automatically judging them for why they're doing something is having curiosity about, hmm, I wonder what they're dealing with right now that caused them to do blank thing that I don't like that I'm judging them for. Right. Cause then having that curiosity can, um, can just help us, it helps ourselves because by judging that other person, we're just making ourselves angrier. We're, we're ruining our own calm, but that curiosity 
is helping us have compassion for the other person. And it brings more of the heartwarming feelings, right? That curiosity can also bring the compassion for ourselves of, oh, why is it I'm doing that? And, and just, and it can help bring up all these other things of, okay, everybody experiences that at some time, right? We're all human. Being imperfect is part of the human experience. And so, okay, so the opposite, obviously, of imperfect is perfectionism. You know what I mean? And a lot of people, you know, when they're engaging in mindfulness practices or would like to engage or even with meditation, you know what I mean? They want to be perfect. And I remember Tim Ferriss said about four years ago in a book that he wrote, I forgot what the name it was, uh, what the name of it was, but he said that in an hour of, let's say, meditating or doing this or some kind of practice, don't, again, judge yourself, but those last three minutes of the hour could be the perception shifter of whatever it may have been. So, you know, when people begin to engage or like, what are some common practices with engaging in mindfulness? Does that mean like going out into nature? A lot of people, they would expect you to like, like you were saying just before, you know, the video, before I press record, like people you know, out there in the park and they're like, um, no, it's not like that or anything. But yeah, well, what are some, um, what are some ways or simple ways that people can begin to engage right now with the feelings that they're feeling? Because again, there could be a lot of tension that's happening within mm -hmm. the bodies. And of course, with tension, that causes stress. Stress lowers the immune system. A lower immune system makes you more vulnerable to all the things that are out there in the world, not only, you know, specific viruses, which is like, you know, all over the media, but other things also like high blood oh, pressure. Like the fear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the fear that people are trying to raise and the, uh, the obsession with it. Right. Of, oh, must keep checking the news for more and more and more and more bad news. And instead of looking inward, and focusing on the things that I can control. <laughs> right. Um, so, yes. So as far as a few things. So mindfulness is paying attention on purpose to the present moment without judgment. So part of paying attention, it could be noticing any one or more of the senses. So that could literally start with, and, it, and this doesn't have to be a long, fancy practice to start with. You could literally practice mindfulness for one day and you're going to be reaping benefits, right? So you could, I like to put my hand on my heart because first of all, um, the touch releases oxytocin, the bonding hormone. Right. And it helps your, yourself to soothe yourself. and Part of mindfulness is noticing where we feel different emotions in the body. So sometimes I put a hand on the heart and a hand on the stomach because I can feel a lot of my emotions through the tightness in the chest or the tightness in the stomach or whatever is going on. So some people, if they feel it a lot in their head through a headache, might put the hand here. So if it's going to help you notice your present moment experience, you can notice the sensation. So a lot of beginning mindfulness practices begin with mindfulness of the breath. So just paying attention to that breath and noticing the physical sensation, what happens as you inhale and as you exhale. Can we just spend a couple of inhales and exhales? Sure, and just, sure. Can we just notice together? Because it's different for different people. Can, but can we just notice where we most feel the breath in our body? Right? So if, if it's comfortable for you, you can put a hand on the heart and a hand on the belly. Mm -hmm. Do you, would you like me to like pull up something? Like, like some kind of photo so people can... No. no, no. Literally just... Because this is something that can be done any place, right? You don't okay. have to have a special meditation cushion mm. or be in a, a peaceful garden, right? right. You can uh, do it anywhere. Okay. Um, 
So just as we take a deep inhale, just notice where can you most feel that breath? Is it, and then exhale as whatever is comfortable for you. Um, so some people, they can most feel that they're breathing in their belly. Mm. For some people, it's in the chest. Mm -hmm. For some people, it's in the nostrils. Mm. And with that, some people feel the sensation of breathing more distinctly in one nostril over the other. So you can notice that in just a couple inhales and exhales. Arsenio, personally, did you notice a difference as far as like, oh, I can feel the breath more vividly in one certain area? Yeah, it's kind of like right in this area, which is interesting. Yeah, because I could feel it like just goes, and then it just stays yes. right there, which is interesting. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, so for you right there in the chest, usually for me, it's in the stomach, but depending on my emotion, it can change. And so being that curiosity is a huge part of mindfulness, see if you can just be really, really curious and practice a beginner's mind with your own breath. So beginner's mind is an attitude of mindfulness in which we um, encounter something as though we've never experienced it before. Like kids do this all the time. When something brand new to them, they're just full of all this wonder right. and amazement mm -hmm. and curiosity. If you can practice that same beginner's mind and curiosity with your breath of noting what you feel and how it feels. Um, is my breath rapid? Is it shallow? Is it deep and shallow? That is going to bring relief to whatever your experience is because that awareness of the breath is your present moment experience. That's where you're living in the present moment. And it takes away the stress of obsessing about something that happened in the past that you can't change. And it takes away the anxiety of something that you're worried about that could happen in the future, but you don't know. And once you're just paying attention to what is happening within you right now, a lot of times you might realize, ah, this experience right now, it's not that bad, right? I have this breath. This breath is always with me for support. Right. Other people may have let me down. There may be tons of circumstances out of my control, but my breath is always with me for support. And that breath work has huge benefits of not only lowering cortisol, the stress hormone, right. and therefore lowering your blood pressure, but strengthening your immune system. And people who practice mindfulness on a daily basis, they're strengthening areas of the brain and the prefrontal cortex that make them less reactive. So practicing mindfulness is a proactive Exercise, just like your physical exercise is important and your eating healthy foods is necessary for your holistic health, so is mindfulness because practicing every day time for yourself to be still and quiet is strengthening that part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex that makes you less reactive. So a lot of people after practicing mindfulness for a while will notice that, ah, that situation that used to trigger them and make them have a lot of stress, let's say something that was on a daily basis, like traffic. Right. Or, you know, somebody that they see every day with an irritating habit. They notice that after a while that, oh, I'm not as bothered by these same everyday situations as I used to be. And, and, and some of the some of the ways where they feel like that, like shallow breathing, like you said, the deep breath, you, you know, we were taking those deep breaths and whatnot, but shallow breathing, what does that normally indicate? Uh, so it can be a lot of things. So um, I will give you an example. Mm -hmm. 
I had a phone call last fall that was really, really bad news for me personally. Mm -hmm. And I took that moment, the phone was, I had my phone on speaker and I put the phone down and I literally put a hand on the heart and a hand on the stomach. And I just took a moment to notice and I just noted in my head what was happening. Okay. My heart rate had drastically increased. Wow. And I just noted, okay, rapid heartbeat not in the stomach. And that saved me from reacting in a way on the phone that could have really made my relationship worse with that other person on the phone because I took the time to know. The me of a few years ago before practicing mindfulness would have had something shoot out of my mouth that I would have been regretting for a long time. So the first, it's easier for some people, for me at least, to notice what is the body sensation. And then I can relate that to an emotion more easily. Um, Both of them are mindfulness. Whether you're noticing um, a body sensation, noticing an emotion, a thought, a story, et cetera, that's, that's all mindfulness. But they all allow you no matter what it is you're noticing in the present moment, they allow you the opportunity to respond more skillfully afterward. So a lot of people, um, after practicing mindfulness, they use these body sensations as an early warning signal of, oh, that body sensation, that's what happens when I'm about to get mad. And I should take some time for myself right now before things get worse. And then you can notice patterns within yourself. So I've no, I've noticed things like, oh my gosh, if we're talking about unpleasant emotions, ugh, when I think about the ex-boyfriend, I feel it in this certain part of my stomach. Oh, okay. And and so you and so I just treat with curiosity of, okay, that is what, um, that is what hurt feels like. Mm -hmm. That is what betrayal feels like. And what it does is it takes away that identification or that attachment to the story of what it is. Mm -hmm. Instead of, like we had mentioned before, instead of attaching myself to the story of like victim, it just allows me to, to know, okay, just, just like an observer. Okay. I'm observing within my body. Ah, of ah. This is what hurt feels like. And it can bring so, 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 so much relief because we are allowing ourselves not to get stuck in the chaos of what's going on. So, right, we can, we can use the phrase of, are you in the storm of your emotions or are you observing the storm? And you can observe what's going on without getting caught up in it all, right? At Dan Harris, who, um, gosh, in the U.S., he is a news anchor for Good Morning America. Uh, he's written books about mindfulness has the app the mindfulness app that's called 10 percent happier he has this book that i enjoy called um meditation for fidgety skeptics and in the beginning of the book he compares mindfulness to a waterfall and it, it, he's he's very amusing he draws a very simple image of a waterfall yeah. and says that the, the stream of water is like our conscious self that's always saying, me, 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 me. Right. And mindfulness is like stepping back behind the waterfall and observing those thoughts and emotions. 
which is a far more pleasant place to be. It's in, cause then you're in a place where you're not beating yourself up for feeling it. You're just noticing it and learning to take away judgment from it. And like anything, it gets easier with practice. Wow. I love it. And you know, and to, you know, sum this up, you of course do so many things with mindfulness and I've, oh my God, I'm just so much more aware. Like things that I would be so reactive to is now it, it, it's, it, it doesn't happen to me anymore because I just, I put myself into their shoes and then I have that buildup of compassion, like self-compassion, like, okay, that person, let's say two, three years ago, right? That person did that. I would be very reactive and I would go online. I'd be like, yeah, they did this. They, but now I would say, huh, okay, let's look at her background, you know? And then I, and then I, I kind of put myself into the shoes of that individual. This is what Michael Bernard Beckwith uh, has done, like, you know, on stage and I've seen on so many different occasions. So you, you have something very big coming up with another individual and big yes. shout out to this guy by the name of Nathan. I'm so grateful because he's the one that ha introduced us. Was it last year? It must have been very yeah. early last year if it happened. It must have been very, very early. Because yeah. he introduced me and the next thing you know, me and you, we just, oh my God, she's my partner in crime. But you got something very big coming up within, what, probably three days time from when this debuts. And what exactly is that? Yes. So I had many people ask for beginners mindfulness mm. instruction. Yes. And so Nathan Todd and I, and Nathan Todd is this awesome life coach. I recommend following his content. Right. Nathan Todd and I are creating together a mindfulness mini course. It's 14 days. So 14 lessons and the lessons are each about 10 to 15 minutes. So not super overwhelming right, right. with simple tips of ways that you can start your own mindfulness practice. And so we'll include the, the link for that here, mm -hmm. but with each of the 14 days, you get a video with the, the 10 to 15 minute lesson. Plus we have PDF resources, such as some journaling and reflection to do to help you um, with articulating what you're noticing about yourself. And um, we'll have some guided practices and access to a community where we can all talk about our mindfulness journeys together and then ask me and Nathan any questions that you want as far as support for your mindfulness practice or what kind of content you would love to see more of. So please, please join our 14 day mindfulness mini course. Um, Nathan has kind of described it as a way to find calm within the chaos. Mm -hmm. And, um, of course, like I said before, calm is, it can be a side effect of mindfulness. Um, but it, mindfulness is a very brave thing because you are becoming aware of everything coming up for you, the good, bad, and the ugly. And this is something I'm very passionate about. And I just want to spread mindfulness because it adds health to us all. And once you, so once we all have practiced self-care and mindfulness, we're able to better serve others. We're able to feel more fulfilled and more um, balance and peace in our lives. And that's what we need, especially in this time of uncertainty. Oh, man, that was so good. There's so many different actionable items, so many things that some of you probably just embodied and went back to those situations where you have felt feelings of, you know, the feelings that she has talked about 
Uh, but again, with those simple steps, you know, the curiosity, the acceptance, there are so many, there could be areas that you're trying to focus on in terms of, okay, I'm curious to why this, okay, I'm going to accept this. Okay. I don't have to accept this because again, this is the mass hysteria that's happening. So let me just, okay, what am I feeling right now? The different techniques, the deep, the deep breathing. All of those things again would be explained in such a you know in in depth on of course uh, Katrina and Nathan's nice little mini course that they're going to be launching very soon. So if you guys are interested in that, make sure you hit the description again. I tag Katrina on my Instagram on so many different things. So again, if you guys are interested in the things that she has going on, or if you have any questions for her all her links and everything would be in the description. So Katrina, thank you so much for explaining in depth a lot of different things and how we could just become so you know, like self-aware of the feelings that we're feeling. Mm -hmm. This is very, very important right now for everyone in the world right now, because there's so many different new things that are happening you know three days ago hey arsenio you can't leave this uh you can't leave bangkok anymore they closed down all the roads and the next you know okay arsenio what's my reaction does that really affect me no okay accept it you know what i mean just taking those deep breaths i mean it could be so vital for a lot of people out there especially students that follow me in pakistan some students that follow me in monterey mexico because they're like oh my god there's so much that's happening. Well, you know what? Now you have those little things that you can do on a routine basis. Or if those of you are at home and you guys are looking to say, you know what? Yes, I would love to do this. You guys know how to get in touch with Katrina. So Katrina, again, thank you so much for coming on. Yes, thank you. And just everyone remember, we're all in this together. If there's any question related to mindfulness you have, please send me a message via Instagram, um, Facebook, anything. I just want to help support you so that you can support all the people you encounter in your life. And with that being said, guys, thanks for tuning in to either the Arsenio Buck Show or Arsenio's ESL podcast. Again, any questions, you shower them, shower them away and you make sure you get in contact with both, of course, Katrina and I, if you guys have any additional questions, I'm your host, as always, over and out.